Good afternoon. Welcome everyone to the Georgia Tech Manufacturing Institute Spring Lunch and Learn Lecture Series. My name is Paige Shi and I serve as the Strategic Partners Officer for GTMI. I co-host this uh, series with Dr. Billy D. Brown, who is also with GTMI. Uh, GTMI hosts this lecture series each spring and fall semester as an avenue to share and exchange manufacturing knowledge within our global community of researchers, students, industry, and government partners. GTMI is part of the larger Georgia Tech research enterprise that includes 10 interdisciplinary research institutes. GTMI focuses on manufacturing research, development, and deployment, uh, designed to address the grand challenges of today's manufacturers, and we help our partner organizations, both internal and external, move innovation from the lab to the marketplace. GTMI has a wide array of facilities and equipment located on both main campus for basic research and in the nearby Advanced Manufacturing Pilot Facility, uh, also known as AMPF, for applied research. Our mission includes education and workforce training, collaborative partnerships with industry, academia, and government, and of course, thought leadership. During today's presentation, audience members are automatically muted to minimize background noise disruptions. However, we strongly encourage you to use the chat feature to submit comments and the Q&A panel to submit any questions you may have for the speaker as they come to mind throughout the lecture. And we'll address the questions with our speaker uh, at the conclusion of his lecture today. Today, we're very pleased to welcome Dr. Ibu Matthews, who will discuss enhancing process control in 3D printing. This presentation will review recent developments in understanding and controlling light matter interaction and material response associated with laser powder, powder bed fusion additive manufacturing. As part of the critical assessment of the physics of the process, validated hydrodynamic finite element model simulations have proven to be extremely valuable and can be used to inform rapid solidification microstructural models. The talk will also cover new approaches to process optimization that have emerged from modeling efforts which can improve material properties and part performance. Dr. Ibu Matthews is Division Leader, Material Science Division, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory within the Physical and Life Sciences Directorate. His expertise includes laser material processing, laser matter interaction science, process optimization of advanced manufacturing, and high-speed in-situ characterization methods. Prior to his current role, uh, Dr. Matthews served as group leader in the material science division and program group leader for the laser material interaction group in the National Ignition Facility and Photon Science Organization. Before joining the laboratory, Dr. Matthews was a member of the technical staff at Bell Laboratories, focusing on optical microspectroscopy and managing projects aimed at developing passive optical network prototypes. Dr. Matthews is currently a co-organizer for the Materials Research Society and Materials Science and Technology Symposiums, a member of the Academic Advisory Board at Norfolk State University, and a fellow of the Optical Society of America. Dr. Matthews holds a PhD in physics from MIT and a BS in applied physics from the University of California, Davis. Welcome, Dr. Matthews. I'll turn the mic over to you. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Professor Xi, for that uh, very warm introduction. And I want to thank you and uh, Professor Brown for inviting me to uh, share our research in metal 3D printing. I also want to acknowledge uh, Professor Aaron Stebner, who uh, made the connection here. And I'm uh, looking forward to uh, actually visiting campus in a few weeks. So, again, thank you for this uh, very kind introduction. So, uh, as uh, Paige said, I'll be talking about enhancing process control in metal 3D printing, but I thought I would start with a little introduction uh, of our laboratory and the area that I, I work in that I lead now in material science. So that's a picture of our, our campus and of a, a wide angle view. Um, a, a better view, I would say, this is actually one that has uh, green grass in it, which is somewhat rare in, uh, in California these days, uh, but shows our campus again and, and gives you some stats uh, about the, the lab who were established in 1952. Uh, you know, we're at the height of the uh, Cold War and, and uh, had our, our uh, seeds in the Manhattan Project uh, from um, Los Alamos. There are currently about 8,000 employees. Uh, we're over, spread over a square mile. That's the square mile you see right there. And we have an annual budget of, of almost $3 billion. Uh, a lot of that um, budget, or roughly half of it, has is, is grown in the last six to seven years as we operate a uh, uh, modernization and uh, life extension program at the lab. There's also another facility that's off in the hills called Site 300 where we uh, do lots of exciting explosive research where no one will uh, get mad at us for making uh, loud noises. As a lab, we are one of 
17 Department of Energy National Laboratories, or FFRDCs, and you can see the spectrum of different laboratories. And we fall in the multi-purpose national security uh, type of lab, like Los Alamos, like Sandia National Lab. Uh, but you can kind of see where the other labs sort of you know, fit in, the, the multi-purpose science labs like, like Argonne and, and Berkeley, uh, and then the single-purpose labs uh, such as um, INL, Jefferson, and Ames Lab. As far as our mission, the bottom line uh, mission for us is to strengthen national security through world-class science, technology, and engineering. Uh, the stockpiled stewardship part I briefly mentioned, so that's to ensure the, the safety and, and, and reliability of, our, of the nation's stockpile to basically send a um, uh, sort of certification to the, to the president that everything, with DOD, that everything is, is on the up and is a, an effective uh, deterrent, but we also perform research and support mission really in uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction, threat reduction, multi-domain deterrence, range from cyber to, to space, and a growing uh, component in energy security and climate resilience. As we know, this has been in the news for the last several years of how we deal with the uh, current um, global warming crisis, and we've uh, been investing quite heavily in this area in the, uh, in the last few years. And underpinning all of these mission areas are our disciplines, so the disciplines, the science, engineering, computing, and they all map into these mission space. So we have what we call a, a mission pool where the, the top row are asking the disciplines, we need this, you know, certain types of capability, whether it's material science, uh, laser research, and at the bottom up, we're pushing uh, advances in technology, trying to see ahead of uh, what for threats and what sort of uh, opportunities are, are next. So just a couple quick org chart pictures here. So we have this uh, construct called the matrix. Uh, we, as I pointed out, have this interplay between our mission uh, areas where, where we have directly funded uh, work from Congress. And those are led by uh, the folks in the uh, sort of teal uh, panels in weapons in lasers and in uh, the sort of cash hall global security. And then feeding into those are the capabilities, the disciplines in computing, engineering, and uh, physical life sciences. And uh, the way it's meant to work is that when a mission need is there in either lasers, weapons, or, or global security, we assemble a, 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 an answer to that of some mix of computing, engineering, and physical life sciences. And when the mission need changes, we just reconfigure and go after the next thing. So that's kind of why we're organized the way we are. And I live down in the uh, physical life sciences. That's that's uh, my boss, Glenn Fox, who's the associate director at the lab uh, for physical life sciences. And within physical life sciences, I run the material science division. It's the largest division, in fact, almost by a factor of two in most cases. 450 staff, 18 groups, and we have a budget of about 200 million dollars. In fact, that's an old picture down there. That's probably half. I think we're probably about 280 or or, uh, or so at, in that uh, picture, but I work together with the other division leaders in physical and life sciences to build discipline, build uh, capabilities that uh, serve the lab's mission. But this is where I sit as division leader uh, and um, glad to answer questions later about what we do in material science more broadly, but I will touch a little bit on, on some of our uh, emerging trends. So I mentioned the, the uh, energy uh, opportunities, the, the opportunities in, in, in climate science and in, uh, in, in carbon. Uh, that's really grown for us. So just some uh, um, places where we think are, are next for us, where we're growing, is in AI and data science for, for advances in material science, uh, predictive materials modeling, functional materials for, for quantum information science and quantum materials, materials for energy and carbon conversion. That's what this uh, Getting to Neutral report uh, is about. It came from my division. And then what I'll talk about today is advanced manufacturing and designer materials to meet mission critical needs. Now, these are all growing. These are all areas that, that we're investing heavily in, but we always have an enduring need in actinide science, in uh, energetic materials, and in laser uh, materials, either optical materials or, or targets for inertial confinement fusion and high energy, high energy density science. So with that, I'll close the intro of the uh, material science division and the, the lab in general, and let's talk about advanced manufacturing, some of the work we're doing in metal 3D printing.
So most of you are likely familiar with metal additive manufacturing. Uh, there are many reasons why we like the technology, the design flexibility, improved performance, weight reduction, a digital uh, process chain or digital thread. And just to be sure that we're talking about, and what I'll talk about primarily is this one version, most popular, I'd say, laser powder bed fusion, where you're going layer by layer to selectively fuse uh, layers of powder and uh, build up a 3D part like you, you see there. Now, at first glance, this looks simple enough. Uh, surely you can, you can make parts that look good without too much trouble, but uh, we know there are some problems that arise from the complex nature of the process itself. And going back five, six, seven years, uh, uh, the group I started in this area before I became division leader specialized in understanding the, the science, understanding the physics of the process, try to understand how defects are formed and how uh, the process can be optimized. Because we know that there are several challenges to additive manufacturing, to metal additive manufacturing. Uh, microstructural defects in, in many different forms, typically lack of fusion or other types of porosity, but surface roughness. Uh, things of that nature. Residual stress, it's a, it's uh, you know, heating and cooling is at a million degrees per second or so, uh, and we have very steep uh, gradients, which can drive high residual stresses. We can have undesirable microstructures and phases. And that's kind of coupled with the fact that the alloys for metal AM were not, uh, um, are not typically optimized for rapid solidification. Uh, they were typically made for uh, casting processes and, and uh, ones that didn't have these steep gradients and very high cooling rates. So because we've got this very chaotic process, when you start looking down at the micron and, and microsecond timescale, uh, a lot of bad things can happen. And so um, I'm going to talk now about how we uh, get around these by optimizing certain aspects of the, of the process. So the, the challenge can be addressed uh, if you start to look outside of those uh, cast uh, uh, casting alloys and start looking at how you can optimize the solidification itself through modifying heat sources. So the challenge is to control the local thermal histories, defects and phases, and try to improve our ability to qualify and certify a process by eliminating all these defects and these bad attributes. And this was a project that actually started back in um, uh, 2018 that I love, a relatively large project that's now kind of spun out into some different areas. But this was essentially what we were after uh, in this project and is now again uh, grown. And the approach we were taking and still continue to take is to uh, tailor the energy sources to beam shaping uh, based on uh, simulation. So to be able to predict what thermal history you need based on um, the desired microstructures and, and, and reducing the residual stress and predict or uh, prescribe what alloy and what beam shaping uh, uh, you need to, to accomplish that. So being able to, to tailor the heat sources uh, is going to require understanding, controlling a lot of the, the effects that I showed on the pre previous uh, slide. But when done right, we think we can uh, get an optimized um, material that way. Okay, so I hope I've set the stage for, uh, of course, the lab background, but in, in uh, where the challenges are in AM. And now I'll talk about this digital twin uh, framework for predicting AM microstructures. And I'll go on and, and uh, talk about the two uh, little uh, tweaks or knobs that we've been playing with, structured light and modification of alloys. So looking at this picture, just to just kind of reiterate it again, the, the pieces of our, our solution involve designed optical sources derived from simulation, optimized alloys, and uh, with that, the ability to tailor materials and not, not only tailor them uh, uh, across an entire part, but because you're beam shaping and you're able to control the heat input, you can start to contemplate structures like this where you're writing in uh, different microstructures based on the laser input. So you're able to architect materials at the microstructure, not just physically architect them like uh, impellers and, and lattices. So this is basically the outline of, the, of, of what I'll be talking about. Now, how does this work? Um, I'm showing here a solidification map for a, a typical alloy that you would uh, uh, process in uh, metal additive, maybe uh, 316 steel, TIE 64, could be in canal. Uh, but in many cases, we end up with a columnar microstructure. This is a um, structure where the grains uh, epitaxially penetrate through the different layers, uh, producing large grains and a, and a 
uh, um, grains that therefore lead to anisotropy in the material properties and mechanical properties. That's generally not uh, what we want. On this map, you're seeing the transition that can occur, however, between columnar and equiax, equiax being a more favored microstructure, typically smaller grains, and, and uh, as, as it's understood, equiax are isotropic. And this is plotted over the uh, temperature gradient solidification velocity map. Now, what happens when you start to introduce a modification to the standard Gaussian uh, laser beam? Uh, what you can do, what we can uh, afford with that is the ability to lower thermal gradients. In order to uh, do that, you have to shape the beam such that the, the, the gradients and the intensity profile are, are also uh, uh, decrease, but you can't just do that blindly, as I'll point out. Uh, just going to larger beams has its own downfall, so there's uh, kind of a best of both worlds type of shape that allows uh, peak to high peak temperatures but larger and uh, 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 shallower gradients where it matters. So that's one approach to lower the operating, uh, sorry, or lower the, um, you know, the uh, thermal history or the, the processing conditions to meet the uh, the transition point or go beyond the transition point to enhance equiaxed nucleation. The other option is to do alloy optimization, and that you're fundamentally changing where that transition is. So you keep your processes, let's say a Gaussian beam where they where it is, but you're moving now where that transition occurs, and you're able to uh, enhance the uh, nucleation rates and the uh, tendency for equiax growth. Um, Ideally, you're able to play with both of them, meaning that you have both alloy design to have uh, um, a better chance uh, at, at solidifying the right microstructures under rapid solidification, but you're also tweaking the beam so you can get this local control of microstructure as well. Okay, so let's step into the digital twin modeling. So this is uh, work by Saad Kairala, who's, who's worked on our team, as, as well as uh, others in the uh, microstructure modeling wrong page she at Taiwo K. Uh, and so the way this this process works it's 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 roughly a feedback kind of uh, optimization where we start with the multi-physics model and it looks something like this so this is showing a, a high fidelity uh, um, uh, laser matter interactions and melt flow model that captures just about all the physics of the process uh, including the uh, melt ejection the ray tracing coupling uh, and so on, and that goes in as a thermal history or, th or uh, sort of thermal boundary conditions to two models. One's the cellular automata, which allows you larger scale uh, microstructure modeling to give this, uh, you can see this um, uh, columnar structure versus the equiax down in the base plate, uh, as well as inputting to phase field models, which will allow you to understand the changes in the gray morphology uh, dendrite tip uh, velocities and, and uh, compositional segregation. Those then can feed back into how we optimize the laser sources and we uh, complete a, a, a sort of a cycle on that. All, all the while we're comparing with experiment validation through therm thermal imaging, uh, through absorptivity measurements, and also inputting uh, CALFAD data uh, to uh, uh, have material properties uh, available for the multi-physics model. This is just showing you how the uh, CA model looks after it's uh, you're inputting. We're inputting this uh, detailed uh, thermal history from the multi-physics model, and this is the uh, phase field prediction for a tiniobium alloy. And I'll show a little bit more of that on this uh, second slide. These movies will play. And so we were able to uh, show recently in a um, publication led by Joel Berry. Uh, that our facial models could be tweaked to uh, predict the change in grain morphology and in solidification morphology from dendritic cellular uh, to planar and group well with, uh, with um, uh, SEM images of the, uh, uh, of the microstructures. And this is for a tight iobium uh, alloy. So the effort that I described earlier, uh, that I'm describing now, that started in 2018, was, was uh, organized around these uh, Taylor energy sources and, and alloy designs. I will point out that we also looked at uh, temporal modulation, so uh, that's not going to be included here, but uh, we, we looked at um, uh, uh, approaches like uh, laser shock peening, as well as just uh, microsecond modulation that some of the machines in the commercial space have, like the Renishaw. And then on the prediction and validation side, I, I just described your our uh, digital twin uh, work that we're doing. 
And uh, kind of behind all that is our cross-cutting di uh, diagnostics that we use to uh, for uh, to validate the models, uh, enable some amount of process control, and uh, characterize the microstructure in, in novel ways, such as with our dynamic uh, TEM system. Okay, so I'll talk now in a little bit more detail about uh, structured light and uh, and the beam shaping I I, um, I mentioned. So uh, in being able to control the laser, one of the first things we did was uh, see how we can control just the laser intensity to minimize defects. So the, the process control uh, using modified laser beams really starts with just that, being able to understand the coupling between uh, defects and the laser intensity before we get into things like laser beam shaping. And in this example, I'll show you how we uh, predicted a, a pore being created uh, using our finite element model, our, our uh, multi-physics model. And in case you're uh, curious what all those little uh, strings are, those little lines, those are laser ray traces that allow us to carefully model the absorbed energy as a function of angle and a function of multiple reflections in the pit. Turns out that's critical in terms of uh, capturing the absorbed energy uh, into your system. But nonetheless, you can see as we go around a, a turnaround, this is a typical type of maneuver for metal 3D printing, the serpentine uh, um, sort of uh, uh, path. And at the end, you see the melt pool, which is in red, and the vapor depression, which is inside of that red uh, envelope, uh, 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 are exacerbated and uh, cause uh, pores to uh, initiate at the end. And of course, pores are bad. They, our stress concentrators can lead to um, can lead to a part failure. Uh, on the other hand, what we were able to do is minimize, or sorry, control the melt pool depth uh, so that that doesn't happen at the end. And the function that comes out of that is the laser power required to do that. So this is through a PID loop that's inside of the model. And I'll show you what that looks like in this, um, this next simulation. So now we've constrained the melt pool depth so it doesn't uh, go into these uh, into this deeper keyhole, this, this uh, uh, region where you're getting uh, pore defects, it's maintained at a const, roughly constant depth, and therefore no pores are created. And we wanted to see how this would compare with uh, with experiment. So we partnered with our some colleagues at uh, Slack National Laboratory to uh, do this experiment, where we had a constant power, and then one where we used the model predicted constrained depth reduction, which uh, had this power mapping where as we go around the turn, the power is reduced. As it accelerates through the turn, it, it comes back up a little bit, but then it goes back down. And then on the way out, it's actually a little bit lower because there's residual heat that's been deposited from that uh, from that uh, path or that um, uh, going into the turn. And this was published uh, with, with our colleagues as well, a number of other uh, papers that describe this, the model, the validation, and the uh, X-ray uh, radiography experiments. That went with it. But going a step further, we know we can do a lot more than just amplitude control with structured light. And um, uh, my postdoc, Tej uh, Tumkur, has uh, been uh, championing this area where he's looking at not just amplitude control, but phase control and polarization control to try to affect melt pool dynamics. Of course, structured light is used in uh, lots of different areas, not, not just in added effects, but I would say we're kind of new in, in, in using it in additive manufacturing, but from facial recognitions to, to LIDAR to optical metrology, structured light is used to, to great effect. Our first foray into this actually uh, came, uh, actually just before this post, like I mentioned, uh, started, uh, Tian Railing uh, led this first paper on just changing the beam in, ter uh, in terms of its uh, ellipticity. So going from a Gaussian beam to a beam that's either uh, thinned out uh, along the uh, um, laser scan direction or 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 uh, or inverse to that where it's it's wide across the uh the track and i'll just point out that uh what we constrained in this was the geometric average of the intensity uh such that the uh, peak temperatures at least for a static beam would be cre would be predicted to be about the same uh so despite the fact that the beam has been widened out in one direction it's been thinned in the other direction so that we still get reasonable peak temperatures, but we're able to have low gradients in uh, at least one of the two directions. So that's really the uh, important point here. And if you look a little closer at what the resulting microstructures were, this for 316 uh, L steel, 
indeed, we were able to show that for uh, a set of conditions in uh, show that we published in this paper that we had uh, columnar, uh, in fact, in, in general, had more columnar, uh, uh, tendency of columnar growth in Gaussian or circular beams and in the elliptical beams, uh, much more uh, mixed type of nature. We may not call it pure equiax, but a more of a, a mixed uh, behavior, but this is for single tracks. And so the question, of course, is that uh, it's easy uh, to do lots of fun single track experiments and simulations for that matter, but what happens uh, when you move to 3D? And so we, we did that and we're able to uh, instrument one of our uh, custom R&D machines from Econity 3D to have uh, an elliptical beam. And later on, we, we used uh, use it to study the vessel beams, which I'll show you in a moment. But you can see that the um, the uh, macro, so-called macro structure that's showing all these different uh, melt pool uh, um, cross sections uh, looks quite different between the Gaussian and the elliptical. You get much more spread out. And this would be consistent with having shallower gradients we start looking at the orientation maps, you can now start to pick out how there are many more uh, longer uh, columnar grains in the Gaussian case as opposed to the uh, elliptical beam. In fact, you get many more uh, small equiax grains, as you can see here, and this is this is persisting throughout the 3D build. And so that was our first, uh, not that long ago, a demonstration of a 3D build uh, using uh, shaped beams and showing the tendency towards more uh, equiax uh, behavior. So looking at the um, orientation map again, and now picking out the, uh, the, the grain sizes, we can see that, uh, again, the, uh, the more uh, larger and, and more columnar grains are uh, characteristic of the uh, Gaussian beam case, and we got more uh, equiaxed uh, behavior and smaller grains in the elliptical case. What was sort of a bonus is what we've got a um, uh, reduction in, in texture in the, uh, in the material, and it could be some ability to minimize the, the need for post uh, tree build uh, uh, post build uh, heat treatments which could, which could uh, really help streamline the process so we think this is a um, uh, possible uh, you know, gain for the industry to try to be able to control these uh, these beams and try to minimize the post heat treatment uh, going down the line okay so what was the, what were the models uh, predicting so here's our solidification maps again. And so uh, this work from uh, Rong Pei Shi in our group who uh, predicted what the uh, nucleation rates would be, what the, um, uh, uh, the uh, grain uh, structure should be using cellular automata. And lo and behold, we see this effect that was uh, illustrated in the beginning of the talk where we're pushing down this uh, solidification uh, region into more equiax as opposed to uh, what we have in the Gaussian case that's on the on the right side. So uh, particularly for the uh, ellipse, uh, sorry, the uh, transverse ellipse, we were able to see a much more, uh, uh, somewhat stronger tendency to get towards that equiax uh, regime. If we look at the grain sizes that we end up, and we sample them in the, the, um, in the simulation at, at different points in the uh, solidification, it, it confirms our, our suspicion that we do have uh, a higher distribution of small grains for the shaped beams as opposed to the uh, simple Gaussian. And there's a number of other uh, um, beams that are shown there as well. And this was also published uh, recently in, in Acumaterialia. Well, there was another uh, observation we made. Um, and this was a little bit of an accident. This is a paper uh, published by uh, Morris Wong uh, in Nature Materials uh, using our uh, Econity 3D R&D system, which had some, had some different characteristics than our commercial machines. He was comparing how the commercial machines from Concept Laser compared with this more customized system. And it turns out that the mechanical behaviors were, were quite different for the um, uh, materials we were producing on the Econity 3D, both in terms of the engineering stress and, and engineering strain. So it's curved way out here. And the question was why, what was really driving that? And again, it was, a very similar story in that the beams tended to have a uh, uh, lower thermal gradients, but they were of a certain nature. They were definitely non-Gaussian. And it turns out that the nature of those beams resembled that of a so-called vessel beam. And so we decided more deliberately to create those beams. And uh, I'll, I'll show you now research that's not by accident, but uh, focused on comparing the uh, solidification behavior of vessel beams that are shaped 
to, uh, to Gaussian beams. So this is, again, first observation using single tracks. You can see the same kind of story where, uh, where we're seeing a refinement in the grain structure. Um, just to give you a little bit of a, of a, a, a primer on, on vessel beams, as not everyone may be uh, familiar with them, they're a class of non-diffracting beams. So in the literature, you'll, you'll um, in many cases, find them as more of a, a scientific oddity and, and of, of kind of basic uh, photonics um, research. But uh, in this case, they actually have some uh, useful uh, uh, characteristics. So the uh, shape itself is that of a sort of a bullseye. And the uh, shape otherwise near the focus is somewhat similar to a, to a Gaussian, with the, but with these, these wings. So the, the, uh, the outer uh, rings of that bullseye are, are relatively low compared to the uh, central lobe. And so there's a wider uh, intensity distribution. Okay, that can be good in terms of the solidification behavior, as I talked about. And there's also an extended depth of focus. So if you look at what this, there's sometimes, sometimes called pencil beams. If you look at the central lobe, it actually extends far outside the so-called Rayleigh range. And it's because of the nature of the generation of the beam uh, uh, using these um, axicon type of lenses. So you get this very long depth of focus, effective depth of focus, and you get a different distribution of light at focus as well. So how can those uh, play out? Well, the extended depth of focus uh, can be good for us because we have a, a problem in many of our systems where uh, thermal lensing can uh, deform and can disrupt the beam. In fact, the accident that I mentioned before was due to some thermal lensing we were having in one of our lenses. This is a common problem in metal additive systems. Well, the thought was, uh, one of the benefits at least, was that uh, for vessel beams, because we have this extended depth of focus, we could be more tolerant to uh, thermal lensing or to shifts in, in, uh, in the uh, focal position of our, of our lenses used in these systems. And sure enough, you look at uh, how the melt pool uh, morphology or melt pool um, characteristics, the geometry of the melt pool dimensions changed as a function of depth. We saw a marked difference between uh, the Gaussian and the, and the vessel beam. So you can see the vessel beam, although the, the melt pool, uh, this is the depth over the width of the melt pool for a single track, uh, it, it was somewhat larger. It was, it was very much uh, more tolerant or had less change, overall change compared to a Gaussian. And the um, thought would be that as you go in and out of focus for the Gaussian, you would change your processing uh, result much more strongly than you would for a vessel beam. So that was an interesting thing. But probably the most interesting was the fact that we observed much less spatter. Okay, so I, I showed you in the uh, early part of the talk how we, the process is very dynamic. This is showing uh, those same kinds of, of high-speed movies. Now we're... Um, not filtering out the emitted light. So you can see the, uh, the spatter, these, these bright spots. This is like welding spatter, but actually a bit different. Um, and we observed that the vessel beam had, uh, in general, less spatter. And one uh, hypothesis for that was that if you look carefully at the vessel case, this uh, wider outer beam tends to interact with the spatter that's coming up and push it back down into the powder bed. And that's quite, quite an interesting effect, but basically you're able to gently heat your spatter, would-be spatter particles, creating a little bit of evaporation that then through vapor recoil uh, sends them back down into the, uh, into the powder bed, thereby suppressing the, um, the spatter and uh, limiting defects that can come from that spatter landing back on your part. That's generally why we don't like spatters, because it, uh, if, if it lands in the wrong spot, you get this, uh, you can, it can be the seed of a, of a defect further on. So both effects uh, were studied by, uh, again, my, my, uh, my former postdoc, Paige Tumkur, in a recent Science Advances article that you can um, have a look at. So just wrapping up with the uh, vessel and elliptical beam, so we're able to get uh, a, a mitigation of, of system drift for, you know, having this longer depth of focus. We showed that uh, the fatters reduce, thereby potentially reducing the um, defects from that, the elliptical beam, in a similar way to the uh, vessel beam, has both a, a hot spot character and a, and a wider uh, distribution character, which allows you the sort of best of both worlds of uh, high uh, peak temperatures at the center, but uh, long uh, thermal gradients or large thermal gradients at the periphery. And this grain refinement I talked about is uh, uh, expected and, and was shown to create 
materials that are somewhat uh, uh, higher strength. Another way we're using laser tuning or, or uh, uh, modifying the uh, laser sources is not necessarily with local shaping, but in adding an additional beam, and this is called the so-called in situ uh, laser annealing, and we're using a, a large area diode to do that. So instead of having a heat source that just comes from the bottom build, which will heat the entire part, uh, is, um, has perhaps some limited ability to go penetrate through large builds effectively. Instead, we propose using a uh, projection of diode light where we can shape the beam to illuminate just areas that you want to anneal as you're annealing the build. And this is based on a custom setup we, we uh, built together, totally uh, home, home built into a glove box at the bottom of that picture you see on the right and a, a typical scan, scanner system, a one kilowatt laser that's coming in and we combine uh, kind of in between those, in that uh, scanner box at the top and the glove box, we introduce a uh, diode beam that comes down through this little top port in uh, conjunction with a standard scan beam. So we're combining both a scanning step and then a uh, annealing step. And this is just showing a simple bridge build that we uh, built to uh, demonstrate the, uh, the effect. We were able to show that we could reduce the residual stress of these as built uh, bridges by up to 90%. The movie on the right is showing the, the scan step and then the annealing step. So instead of letting the part just immediately cool down and build up these large residual stresses, we have a uh, diode beam that uh, uh, turns on right at the end of the scan to keep the heat uh, there and to slowly cool it down. So I'll let this movie play one more time. You'll see the scan beam coming across the part to build this. Uh, Again, the scan beam coming across the part. This is just again a typical uh, Gaussian beam scanning, and you can see that's a the bridge part. Uh, the overhang of the bridge part is slightly warmer than the other parts. And by annealing the uh, part uh, before the next scan, we're able to reduce stress on the order of what we would get from a, a furnace. The other nice thing we can do with this in situ diode or this this uh, in situ annealing is instead of re reducing residual stress we can use it to control the microstructure. So as most uh, folks know that uh, for uh, uh, titanium, aluminum, uh, vanadium, Ti-6-4, we generally have this martensitic phase that comes uh, comes along, this alpha prime that's a very brittle phase. And in fact, can lead to cracking even during a part, uh, uh, part built. It's generally not what we want uh, in Ti-6-4. What we'd like to have is a, a mixture of alpha and beta phase, beta phase being, being more ductile and, and allowing for some relaxation during the build. And by using the diode in conjunction with the scanning beam, we're able to show that just for a single layer, we're currently writing up a paper on a full 3D demonstration of this, we were able to control the alpha beta content and uh, have, a, a again, a part that starts to look more like a annealed part, but all done in the same uh, laser process. Okay, so the final uh, piece I'll talk about is uh, tailoring materials through modified alloy. So, uh, as I showed in the beginning, there were kind of two approaches here. One was to uh, bring the processing parameters down to your kilometer to equiax transition and drive down into uh, more equiax, like I showed for the vessel beam and the um, uh, vessel, uh, sorry, vessel beam and the, the elliptical beams. But the other option is that you can fundamentally move that transition up towards your, let's say, Gaussian uh, beam and have a uh, more suitable alloy for rapid solidification. And that's what we uh, what we did, and this is led, work led by Aurelian Perone, again, Joel Berry, and uh, my colleague Joe McEwen, a group leader in, in uh, my division, is leading a large project on this now based on uh, our uh, materials design simulator. So right, we have the simulation uh, platform that takes input from CalFAD, physical properties, and user-defined constraints, outputs a optimized alloy composition, and uh, will... Uh, uh, be used to predict uh, not just uh, simple uh, uh, binary and, and ternary alloys, but as you'll see in a moment, work that's aimed now at uh, high entropy alloys. But this again combines the um, uh, thermophysical inputs, predictions from CalFAD, and constraints such as uh, the uh, melting range, uh, um, liquid sol uh, solidus range, to try to drive uh, enhanced nucleation. Um, and let me just go to an example of that. So what we did was for a, a simple binary tie niobium, uh, predicted what concentration of uh, tin 
could be added uh, to, to make a ternary that had more enhanced uh, nucleation rates. And, and um, in fact, we were able to show that that just for the this uh, one tiny niobium alloy, we tend, tended to get very large grains. You can almost not see them. They're, they're kind of taking over most of the, the melt pool. Uh, and we can drive a more equiax uh, behavior because we're widening the solidification range uh, through this uh, predicted um, uh, through this uh, predictive model that I showed you. And going a step further, you know, when we think about um, architecting materials and AM, this topology optimization, which is done for not just metals but for polymers as well. Where we'd like to take this is being able to go within the structure itself and tune the material properties on the fly throughout a part. And I talked about that earlier, but being able to combine these topology optimized uh, methods with microstructure uh, prediction and prediction of alloys, prediction of, of heat inputs is what we'd like to um, be driving. And, and particularly we're looking at high entropy alloys and refractories. Uh, Joe McEwen, hopefully I can bring him out to Georgia Tech and give a talk on this at some point, is uh, leading this effort. And just one quick example, this is a paper that's being written right now uh, showing how his group was able to, or is being able to uh, predict yield strength, optimize yield strength for a particular ternary. And we'd like to take that a uh, few steps further in making multi-component alloys um, in refractories to, uh, to, to optimize uh, various properties and uh, various aspects of performance in our, uh, in our components. And let's see, I think just wrapping up, I maybe have just a couple more slides. Uh, one way we're exploring those alloys uh, very broadly is using a direct energy deposition system that just was installed at our additive manufacturing, or sorry, advanced manufacturing lab, I'll show in a moment. Uh, it has a 16 port hopper, so we can mix up to 16 different elements and produce a wide variety of, of alloys. Just uh, skipping on here, I want to get kind of finished up soon. I'll, Get that overview again, overview slide. I do want to just highlight that our uh, efforts in metal additive span uh, quite a range of activities from understanding the physics. You saw a lot of the high speed video and uh, optics, uh, optical uh, images, the uh, radiography, characterize energy coupling through absorptivity, developing novel methods, which I've talked to you, but we also uh, work in process monitoring, rapid quantification. So, you know, coupling that with AI is a big effort right now. Uh, but the work I covered today, just to highlight, is, is in this uh, paper, Science Advances for Beam Shaping, and then the Materials Today paper uh, for uh, alloy design and, and some of our digital twin modeling. Our advanced manufacturing lab is, is uh, where a lot of the experiments occur. It's, it's open for business for collaboration with academia and industry. Uh, this, built, uh, this lab has been built up. Uh, with not just capabilities in printing, but in characterization. And of course, we have all the design tools and, and I talked about the modeling, but this would be a great place to collaborate. Uh, students, faculty uh, are all welcome to come out and, uh, and have a look and, and see what we have going on. And with that, I want to thank all the wonderful uh, colleagues of mine who really did the work that I showed you here today. A lot of it was supported by our internal laboratory directed research and development uh, funding. And I can take any questions uh, that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Matthews. That was a wonderful presentation. It was very informative and exciting developments that are happening um, in the area of additive manufacturing for metals. And uh, I know Georgia Tech is doing some work in that space as well. So we really appreciate you um, taking time to, to share some really relevant information today. So I want to remind our audience members to go ahead and submit any questions you have for Dr. Matthews using the Q&A panel on your screen. Um, and while we're waiting for those questions to come in, Dr. Matthews, I thought um, a topic that might be of interest to some of our audience members today is career opportunities uh, with Lawrence Livermore. I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about, you know, what career opportunities might be available um, and maybe internships and, and even research collaborations. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I have to say, you know, I, I mentioned quickly our budget of almost three billion. You know, that's up, oh, like almost 1.4, 1.3 or 4 billion in the last six years. So we've been hiring like, like, like just uh, like there's no tomorrow. So there are lots of opportunities, especially in uh, in material science, in in uh, metallurgy, in uh, mechanical engineering, um, you know, modeling, experimental. Uh, I think. A lot of what I showed, we're, we're open for uh, more 
folks coming in to support those areas. Um, lot, so I, I talked about the metals. There's uh, lots of work also in polymer research and polymer additive manufacturing, but also just formulation and synthesis. We hire a lot of chemists, um, again, material scientists, uh, chemical engineers. So uh, that's all, you know, there's, I, I can, uh, I would gladly offer our, uh, our jobs portal with with tons and tons of postings that I can I can uh, put you to, and then on the internship uh, topic, we we had slowed down of course through COVID, but typically we have up to a thousand uh, summer students uh, each year all across the lab in all sorts of areas, just material science, uh, and we're starting to get back into business. We're we are taking summer students back this summer, but we have internships throughout the year, so it doesn't be in the summer, and uh, we you know take all types of internships, let's say, I mean, from ones that are un un unprompted, but others that are part of collaborations. I, we've enjoyed lots of uh, university collaborations that are facilitated by having interns at at, at, at uh, undergrad and graduate level. So lots of opportunities. Great to hear, thank you so much. And it looks like we do have several questions that have been submitted by, by the audience. So first, as very interesting talk, do you see an improvement in surface finish finish accompanying the grain refinement induced by laser beam shaping elliptical or vessel profiles? Yeah, that's a great question. We we have have, have not seen such a big difference in the uh, in the surface finish. And in fact I'll, I will admit that for the in situ annealing we, we have to be quite careful not to overheat with the diode because we do end up centering some of the powder and that's what happens. It starts to look a little bit like an E-beam process, right? So uh, we can't have problems with centered powder, powder but uh, in general, there hasn't been a huge uh, advantage in surface roughness, but that's something worth looking at further. Thank you. Um, the next question is, will the recording of this be available on the GTMI website later? Yes. Uh, so we are recording this live session for on-demand later viewing. It will be posted to the GTMI website um, very soon, probably within the next few days. We have permission from Lawrence Livermore and Dr. Matthews to do that. Uh, next question, are you implementing AI or machine learning in your digital twins for alloy process optimization? What are some relatively new alloys with unique properties that are being explored? Yeah, so um, so two answers to that. So absolutely, I, I flashed the slide very quickly, but we are using machine learning to uh, basically accelerate the, the, the phase space, accelerate exploration of the phase space uh, for, for alloys. And I, I won't comment before the the paper comes out, but there are some some new interesting alloys that uh, that we're uh, that we've been discovering. So hopefully that'll be coming out soon. Uh, but again, they're in the re refractory space. Thank you. And one more question. Thanks for the excellent webinar, Ebo. Uh, where do you see the beam shaping science heading toward informing application slash practice? Is there a consensus winner emerging in terms of beam profiles or do we all need to demand an ability to adjust our beam shapes in our machines from the OEMs? Yeah, so I'll say that, um, you know, tackling the OEM question is always uh, always hard. Uh, but one thing that's true about our about current commercial machines is that they're coming with um, multiple beams, right? So where it's going is that we're Starting to re try to recreate some of the effects that we showed with the um, elliptical and vessel beams with just a second uh, uh, synchronized beam. So typically the two beams or multiple beams in a system are uh, are there to speed up the process, basically do parallel processing of a to build a, a large part more quickly. But you can also use them in tandem or use them in, in, in concert such that one is producing a, a, a gradient that you want and the other is producing the melting that you want. So we're exploring that right now. If that can be uh, done, I think it's it's really just a matter of changing the controller in the systems, which is, I think, a easier lift than changing the hardware. So that's where we're going next, to try to see if we can recreate these effects in commercial machines without changing optics. Thank you. So it appears your lectures generated a lot of interest. So we have a few more questions we'll try to address. I know uh, we, we do have a hard stop at one o'clock, but we'll see if we can get through these next few. Uh, the next is, I imagine this air, large area diode laser heating would be useful in reducing residual stresses of AM tungsten or AM refractory HEAs. Have those been investigated in LLNL? 
Yeah, in fact, right now we're um, we have a collaboration with uh, Stanford University and uh, using some some of their models as well. And uh, I'm looking at tungsten, uh, um, as many will know, tungsten, pure tungsten um, tends to crack and not be as useful as it could be if, uh, in, in laser powder bed fusion. But uh, we're attempting now to carefully tune the um, the cooling in, in our tungsten prints uh, to prevent that. So, uh, so yes, that's those are experiments that are happening right now. We've, we've started about not quite a year ago, uh, last last fall is when we started most of those experiments. So hopefully by by the end of this year, we'll have something to, to share. Great, we'll look forward to that. And next question is, just wonder how other process parameters need to be adjusted with the Bessel beam versus traditional Gaussian, uh, the Gaussian beam. Besides grain shapes, did you also observe composition distribution changes with alloys versus Gaussian? Yeah, so um, in the study that we published, uh, we didn't, so there wasn't a, uh, we should have uh, included some TEM work with it. By and large, the, the microsegregation wasn't wildly different, uh, but, it, but it could be different for different alloys. We, we uh, explored just a pretty narrow set of so, uh, one tie iodine and one um, uh, in a stainless steel. But to, to first order, we didn't uh, see much difference in the, in the segregation behavior, more, but I think we, it's worth a, a closer look. Okay, and if you can give us just a few more minutes of your time, we'll, we'll try to address some more of these questions. Very good talk, thanks. Question, as the metal thermal and mechanical properties vary with the thermal history and stress gradient, how are these property variations considered in your FEM? Oh, well, uh, yeah, that's a really good question. I, I um, showed, you know, a lot of single track uh, simulations. So, in fact, uh, you know the, the we have done a, a like a, a double layer and and, uh, and that sort of uh, simulation, but I, I think where the question's going is, um, you know, how do we how do we do uh, a multi-layer prediction? And it, it, it gets tough, it gets expensive very quickly, uh, but we're starting to work on that. We we've, we've just partnered. We have a creative we're putting together with a, an external industry partner who's very interested in this in this question. How do we connect? the uh, predictions we're making in single track. Although, you know, those, those predictions did tend to, uh, for, the, for the grain refinement at least, did tend to um, uh, connect with full builds. But ideally what you really want is a, a complete thermal history throughout the part uh, and done in, a, in an efficient, you know, not ex, uh, inexpensive way. And we don't quite have that, that full model. We have the pieces to it right now. So we, we, we do have the ability to, to uh, predict full build thermal histories at some Resolution. I didn't talk about that model, but we have that in house. We now need to couple it to these other models I predict. I, uh, I presented. So I don't have anything on that yet, but that's a that's a great question. We, we we would like that capability, and we're we're working on it. Thank you. And I see just two more questions. Uh, the first is: While I can see the diode laser based annealing idea working for single tracks, how will it work for multi track deposition, where the effect of the primary beam will outdo what the annealing beam does? Uh, well, so I, I did show full builds uh, with the diode beam. So the, the, a lot of, well, for, for everything. But um, the, uh, perhaps the, the point is that the microstructure control example with the TIE 6 bore was of a single layer. But we're, we're able to show that we can, we, we're doing that in 3D as well. Um, you know, the diode is, it, it's similar to what you would get from a, um, uh, from an oven anneal. And, you know, as long as it's the last thing that the material sees, it's going to see the reduced thermal gradients and the lower cooling. And so it's not exactly, it's not like laser shock peening, right? Where if you're, if you're peening, you're, if your depth isn't, uh, a peening isn't, isn't deeper than your layer thickness, then the, the scanning layer will always erase the, um, the stresses that you're inputting from the peening. But in this case, the annealing beam really is like a, almost like a small oven anneal. Uh, after each step, not before it. Thank you. And the final question that I see is, is there any work currently happening on developing in situ laser shock peening LSP at Lawrence Livermore and how to achieve the necessary beam shaping requirements for LSP? Yeah, so I guess I, I walked right into that one. So uh, yeah, we, we 
so it's it's challenging. There's there's work out of um, EPFL and uh, and uh, EMPA in, in Switzerland that I point you to, uh, Professor Loger and and uh, his group of, of um, produced some nice results in that area. Uh, how to produce good shock uh, conditions uh, without a tamper is kind of the biggest question. If you're really going to combine the processes, um, how can you uh, drive the shocks up without confining the plasma with a tamper? Of course, typical tampers are water, right? Water jets. So you're not going to go in with a water jet in your powder bed. Uh, at least I can't think of a way to do that. Uh, could beam shaping be uh, applied to help uh, enhance the laser shock, perhaps? I mean, you, you, you start to get, you know, ideally you want a, a certain size beam so that you're producing a one-dimensional shock and not a diverging shock. Um, and so that generally means, you know, you, you, you don't want fine features or, or uh, in, in the, uh, in the beam, but it's, it's worth thinking about. We just, we, we tried a little bit of what we call warm laser shock peening, where we, we brought in a pulse laser right at the end of the mill pool before it was solidified. But as I alluded to, if that shock isn't deep enough, you're just going to erase whatever you put in from the shock peening. So you have to get, you know, uh, several hundred microns to a millimeter deep for that, uh, residual shock peen to, uh, to survive. And we haven't figured a way out to do that without uh, a tamper. So I, I don't have a good answer, but it'd be exciting to figure out how to do that believably. And again, I point you to uh, Professor Loger's work in Switzerland for, uh, for, some, for a study on that. Thank you. Well, we're almost out of time. So Dr. Matthews, I wanna thank you so much for um, giving us some of your time today to talk about this really important topic. Um, very uh, important to Georgia Tech and the members of our audience how to improve the metal 3D additive manufacturing process. Um, so we look forward to continuing our discussions with you and over time. And I want to thank our audience members for joining us today. And I encourage everyone to join us on next Monday, April 11th at noon. This will be the, our final Lunch and Learn uh, session for the spring semester. We'll be featuring Dr. Maria Ray Marston, who will present Supply Chain Resilience in the Age of Disruption. Uh, she comes from Accenture, and she's the Global Supply Chain and Logistics Innovation Leader, so really looking forward to that lecture as well. Thank you, Dr. Matthews. Thank you to our audience members, and have a great afternoon. Well, thank you.